know um, how many of you recognize the term if I use it. Uh, it's called nesting dolls. Nesting dolls. I, I was going to, I, I, I was thought about doing a life size version of nesting dolls, but I, I had neither the time nor the skills. So we have a picture of some of those up here. The nesting dolls are the ones that you just unpack one at a time. They've always fascinated me because I always wonder how many will be in there. And sometimes I wonder what will be at the end because some, some of them have surprises. Now these are all painted alike. I, I pulled up a couple other illustrations of nesting dolls. One is superheroes. They're not all the same. And I found a site that makes customized nesting dolls. But uh, they've, they've always fascinated me because uh, I, I always wonder if I've reached the last layer. And some of these nesting doll sets, the last layer is a surprise. It's not like the others. We, um, in some ways, we mirror the idea of the nesting dolls. There's, there's the outer shell. There's what people see. And then there are layers inside. We're going to dig into that just a little bit by using a very familiar text uh, from the book of Mark this morning. And before we dig into that primary text, just a little context. Uh, this is one of the accounts where Jesus is teaching among an audience and uh, the text says that some scribes and some Pharisees have come up from Jerusalem. And he is, uh, he is about 70, 80 miles away from Jerusalem. These people probably traveled about three days to be there. They've come up from Jerusalem, a religious, the religious hub of the Jewish community. They came with a certain amount of authority and presence. We pick up in Mark chapter 7. <clears throat> And the text tells us this, the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law had come up from Jerusalem and gathered around Jesus. And they saw some of the disciples, some of his disciples, not all of them, some of them, eating food with hands that were unclean, that is unwashed. And the text goes on that, um, uh, that they were, with these hands that are unwashed, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing according to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. They observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and kettles. So here's a scene that, that um, <clears throat> these religious leaders that have come up, the Pharisees are the ones that, that have a lot of authority, the uh, scribes are, are professionals in the law. And they've come up, and the best guess is they've come up to scrutinize Jesus. They're looking for flaws. They're looking for mistakes. They're looking for ways that they can tear him down. And as, as they're watching, they notice something in the disciples, that they were not uh, doing the ceremony, ceremonial cleansing the way that the elders had done it. And it was a very involved process, see, because at this point, as they, uh, when people went to the market, when the Jews went to the market, uh, they, there was always a danger they might even brush up against a Gentile. So when they got home, they had to clean up. They had to pour water over, the, over their hands. They, they washed all the instruments that they were going to use to eat. The text goes on, and it says, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating food with unclean hands. Now let's make sure we have a distinction here. When they're talking about the tradition of the elders, they are not talking about things that are derived from the law of Moses, direct commandments from God, direct uh, things that God has instructed them to do. In fact, they have layers and layers and layers of stuff that the, are the tradition of the elders as, as the leaders have come together and have come up with more and more rules. In fact, it started from a, uh, probably a fairly positive outlook. The nation Israel had come from the Babylonian exile. They had come out of that exile. They had been in the exile because they had uh, followed idols and, and gotten involved in things they shouldn't. And so the leaders began to put on rules and regulations to help them monitor themselves, to make sure they didn't get dirty, to make sure they didn't make mistakes. But over time, the rules, the regulations continued to expand and get more detailed and, and more extensive. Originally, they were uh, uh, put in to help people from sinning. 
The list got longer and longer and actually brought a certain level of elitism. <laughs> you, you've, been in, you've been in the marketplace. You might have touched something or someone that's below you. Somebody that's not at the religious level that you are. You better get home. And when you get home, wash that right off. Because you don't want to be tainted by being out amongst people that are below you spiritually. And so they came and they challenged him and they, they evidently weren't finding anything they could challenge him on, but they saw his disciples not fulfilling the laws on the traditions of the elders. And so they challenged Jesus and asked, why is it that they don't do it? Why don't they live according to the tradition of the elders? And Jesus gave an interesting response. He didn't really answer on behalf of the disciples. He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. Well, obviously he wasn't speaking specifically, Isaiah wasn't speaking specifically to these individuals. He was talking about a general principle. As he, as Isaiah addressed the people of his time, it was this reality, these people honor me, the words of God through him. The people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship in vain, their teachings are but rules taught by men. And then he goes on, and you have let go the commands of God and are holding to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And, the, and, and in the Mosaic law, it says anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. And now Jesus is starting to push back a little bit. But you say, but you say, <laughs> here's what God says. It's pretty clear. Honor your mother and your father. But you say, but you say that if a man says to his father and mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is Corbin. That's an interesting word. That is a gift devoted to God. And then you no longer let him do anything for his mother or father. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down. And you do many things like this. Let's just talk about this idea of Corbin. So even through, woven through the Old Testament, were um, offerings and different types of gifts that people could give to God. They could dedicate things to God. And sometimes uh, they, they brought these to the temple. And if they lived a ways away from the temple, sometimes they would hold them until they got to the temple. Well, that evolved over time to where you just say this is dedicated to God, but you don't necessarily have to give it at the temple. So you can enjoy that good painting over your, over your couch uh, and say it's given to God. You can't sell it now because if you sell it, then you've dishonored God. So if your parents have need, too bad. And actually, through the traditions of man, <clears throat> It evolved even to another step that instead of being irrevocable like the Old Testament call, eh, you just say it and yeah, if you change your mind, you can do that. And Jesus is pushing back and saying, come on, are you serious? God said this. He's very clear. And now you've constructed these rules to help you sneak out from the commands of God and you think that these uh, traditions of man are more important. In fact, that's what they became. Later teachers of the law specifically wrote, respected teachers, people that, teachers that would be quoted for centuries after that, they wrote that if it's the tradition of man, if these traditions have a greater authority and power than God's commands. It's incredible how that changes a direct command of God, and in making the rules, catch this, make sure you catch this, in making the rules, they built a framework that completely overlooked the heart of God. The heart of God wasn't, oh, just claim this is going to me and ignore the needs that are around you. The things I've commanded you to do, that is the heart of God as much as anything else. In keeping and making the rules, they lost the heart of God, and they evolved to a system of surface conformity 
uh, to these man-made rules, that evolution always takes place when we focus on rules. Rules just to be done. Rules done to, to just try to please somebody else. And Jesus kind of moves the conversation now to a different level. He moves it to the inner level of the, manner, uh, of the matter. Verse 14, Jesus again called the crowds to him. He said, listen to me and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it's what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. Let's pause here long enough to make sure that we get this. It's a familiar text, and sometimes and when I'm in a familiar text, I go through it fairly quickly. And I don't always pause and understand what the nuance of the text is. You've got the Pharisees and the scribes saying, wash your hands so you're, you're not dirty, you're not ceremonially unclean, you're, you're not polluted. And Jesus is saying, um, it, it's not washing your hands, it's not, it's not touching things that makes you unclean before God. The heart of the problem is not dirty hands, it's the heart itself. It's the attitude, the inner being, the things that come out of a broken life who is, which is under the curse and the power of sin, which limits and holds captive people. Here they're all working up and, and it's, oh, they're not washing, so they're out of conformity. And Jesus reminds them the issue of conformity comes from the heart, it's not from the external. The real issue is unsettled heart. And, and you can almost, I, I, I almost get a sense that he's saying, um, what, why are we arguing? Why are you so hung up about these ceremonial washings? <laughs> Ever get into those type of relational discussions? Where you're, you're just arguing over the best way to go to a friend's house or what you should have for supper and, and you neglect the truth. That, what's, that the base of that argument is nothing about which direction you take or what you're having for supper. There's something in your heart that is unsettled. And most of the times we have those relational discussions. It is because one or both of the people is unsettled, feeling insecure or neglected or unimportant or just greed and selfishness and arrogance. It's stuff in the heart that drives it. It's not the external stuff that we worry about. It's the stuff in the heart. Jesus moves to that core of the, of the matter. And in verse 17, uh, he's, he's already expressed, nothing outside a man makes him unclean, but rather what comes out of the man that makes him unclean. And then after he left the crowd, he entered the house. And his disciples asked him about the parable. And he says, are you so dull? Have you not figured this out? How long have you been with me? How long have you been hearing me teach that the base, the core, the heart of the matter is, is, is how we view life and what's inside of us instead of what we paint ourselves with? Don't you see that nothing enters a man from the outside can make him unclean? For if it doesn't, go into a, it doesn't go into his heart, but it goes into his stomach, then out of his body. And saying this, Jesus declared all, things, all foods clean. He went on and says, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of man's hearts come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. We get that, right? We have something for dinner. The body processes the nutrients. The stuff that is not going to help the body is eliminated. And the greatest problem we can have when we eat with dirty hands is maybe we get some germs, maybe we get sick physically. But it has nothing to do with our moral condition. The moral condition is from here. It is that which which renders us unclean and unacceptable before God. What defiles, 
What separates is not how clean the hands or the bowl. What, what is inside, who we are, is what we are like. What we are inside is who we really are. Does that make sense? The things we think, the things that we choose to do in private, the things we do when we're sure we won't get caught or discovered, that's what defines who we are. That's the true us. And we can do what the Pharisees have done, we can paint on the face, we can go through the right performances in public, but it's really irrelevant compared to who we truly are. Outside circumstances, the actions of others sometimes throw us a little bit off in life, but they themselves don't produce the negative inside. The actions of others don't, don't produce the brokenness inside. They, they, they bring it to the surface. They, they make it visible. They help us recognize it. They are the test of the hearts. Who we are is what springs from inside. That is the true me, and that is the true you. Now, I just want to balance that out because we understand that we are broken people. We're under the power and curse of sin apart from Christ. But Christ, I think, all the way through his teaching is offering them something better. While sin and defilement draw from inside, ultimately so does holiness. As God produces an inner transformation within us, as we respond to his presence, his grace, his invitation to holiness. So as we're looking at this text, again, um, we, can, we can get into that idea that you know, we just paint it on the outside and that and external conformity makes everything work, but it never has. Even from the laws of Moses, the outward conformity to the laws of God, people have failed. Israel, Paul, uh, Luther, us. It seems easier and safer sometimes to, to just live on the surface. Does that make sense? Some of us um, just overlook the need to go inside. Some of us are scared to. Some of us just say, let the sleeping log dogs lie, so to speak. I'm comfortable uh, in life dealing with the inner stuff just brings to the surface painful memories. I've got them all backed up. I've got them all set aside. I don't want to have to worry about them. Sometimes we overlook the need. We come home and we sit back and we, oh, that was, I'm not bad. Didn't kill anyone today. Sure wasn't like the, this guy that I don't like. And we forget that in our heart, oftentimes there is anger, there is malice, there is bitterness. And that's where the pollution comes. It's interesting the amount of smugness and looking down our nose we can end up with as we get complacent and comfortable with just what we see on the outside and forget that it's the heart that needs to be changed. Matthew, in the book of Matthew, chapter 23, uh, he writes this. He writes this about the Pharisees. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, the same group, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, and yet you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness, you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides. You strain out the gnat, but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and self-indulgence. Woe to you, teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrites. You look like whitewashed tombs, which are beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. The same way on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and 
uh, full of hypocrisy and wickedness. A level of self-satisfaction, a level of self Right, a level of self-righteousness. So when I, uh, again, this is a familiar text. Most of you have heard it. A lot of you have gone through this. But let's, uh, let's make sure we, we hear what Jesus is saying. Here's the, uh, here's the Pharisees, the scribes, saying, you're not doing this external thing right, and because of that, you're unacceptable before God. And Jesus says, hey, that's not the measure. The measure is the heart. That's what represents who you are. And in that measure of the heart, what is in your heart will control your life choices. It will drive your choices in life. And I think there's a challenge there. Are you good with what is driving your life? Is that the way you want to be? Are you sure that's who you want to be? It is so easy to just stay more on the surface. But we forget that everything that is driven in our life is from the inner hearts. Do we want to be controlled by unresolved brokenness in our heart? See, what Jesus constantly is offering through through his teaching It's not just exposing the issues that need to be addressed, but there's also an incredible invitation here, an invitation to be set free. I define true freedom as a release from all artificial limitations. And I believe that our fallen state are artificial limitations. They are not how God created man and woman. He created us to be in harmony with himself and free from the brokenness of sin. We have made choices. And he offers consistently to transform us at the core, to give us true freedom and true release so that what we are in our core is what we were actually created to be, and that is to be reflective of God, his glory, his presence, and be in harmony with him. I don't know about you, but it doesn't take me a lot of reading in the Bible. Sometimes it just takes looking at the mirror to understand the world of brokenness and sin is a world I don't want to be in. Well, maybe I chew on a little bit and think, oh, that, then, yeah. But that's not what I want to be. Mention this uh, and other, other venues, that when I grow really old, <laughs> okay, I'm halfway there. Okay, I'm three quarters of the way there. I want my default, when some of my abilities, my mental capacities, when they start to decline, I want the default from my heart to be Christ. I don't want it to be the sin nature. And the only way that happens is allow Christ to change me and work my heart and bring it into conformity with the living Christ. My mom, as she lost capacity and lost her memory, We watched her in that journey. One of the most encouraging things was that she maintained a sweetness of spirit that had been marked by the presence of Christ who changed her heart and her life. That's just a really cool testimony. Speaking frankly, I have been in some situations, and I know when, they, when, when aging happens, sometimes the electrical uh, connections start to break down. But I have seen more than what I want to in my share of Christians who claim Christ, and when they're unable to hold that mask anymore, they get in maybe to a care facility and they are just nasty people. Because who you are is who you are inside. The decorations, they're going to go. So let me just um, wind this down a little bit. 
we don't change who we are by putting on a mask or going through all the different steps that we think uh, the church defines or, or that people will accept. On the other side, it's true too. We don't spend, we don't, we don't get our life changed, our heart changed by what one author calls um, unwise self-dissection where we're always churning up more gunk and, and just are so overwhelmed by, by how sinful we are. That always has to be balanced by the presence of Christ and the fact that we are a child of God if we have accepted him as our Savior. But this is the challenge for this morning. This is the challenge for tomorrow and for this week and for the next month and for the next year. And after and after and after that we allow God to conform us to the image of Christ. So at our core, we reflect him, not our brokenness of sin. And we do that. There's three, uh, there's, there's a lot of different ways. I, I, three that I will suggest to you this morning. One is just to be in the presence of God. When we are in the presence of God, we quit fooling ourselves. <laughs> Every person that I know of um, that is recorded in scripture that encounters God appreciates how broken they really are. They don't walk away smug and self-righteous if they've truly encountered God. They understand the desperate need, but they also understand the immense resource that is there in Christ. It's part of the responsive reading we read from Psalm 139. So the presence of God is, is part of that, conf, that being con, uh, transformed to the image of Christ. But that prayer to God, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. He is the only one that can reveal what's in there. And see if there's any hurtful way in me and lead me to an everlasting way. There are different types of prayer. A lot of times we settle into just the, here's what I need, here's what I want. The prayer of worship and praise is certainly part of what we want to do as we encounter God and, and to make our requests made, made known to God with prayer and thanksgiving, that's an important thing too. But let's not neglect this prayer. Search me, O oh God. Examine my heart. See what's out of balance in me. See, try me, know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any hurtful way in me. And lead me to the everlasting way. Show me what I need to do to change. And then bring the power to change me. That would be the third thing that I would suggest. Because only God can reveal the heart only God can lead us out of bondage. So the third thing, besides um, how the presence of God and the prayer to God, is the practice in God. It is so significant not to be hearers only, but doers of God's word. Don't have time this morning to dip in, dig in really, really deep on that. But I can just tell you that, that we have a responsibility to couple with the grace of God. God is the one that reveals. God is the one that empowers. God is the one that works the change in our life. Let's make no mistake about that. There's a need, a desperate need, a dependency on God. But we are called to couple that with diligently choosing to live out his presence in our life. Years ago, there's a chiropractor I got to know. He was a really gracious, godly, kind old man. And um, until I got into his office, I don't know if you've been at chiropractors, but he had the longest, boniest fingers. And there were times he would find a nerve and it felt like he was just pushing through my back all the way through all I am. You ever had that? And it hurt. 
I didn't like it. It was very uncomfortable. But I can tell you this, that, that because of his work, had he not been doing what he was doing, I probably wouldn't be walking upright today. I might not even be walking. And while it was painful and I didn't like the process, I liked the goal of walking over the goal over the uh, existence of being crippled. Does that make sense? Spiritually, God offers to put his finger on the nerves, on the areas that we need to change. He offers us freedom and change at the core. And that process sometimes is difficult, sometimes it's even painful. But again, this challenge, the driving questions, what do you want? What do you want to define you? What is it really that you want to have controlling you in life? Who do you want to be in the true you? And the beauty of Christ is that he offers a transformation, a change, that we might be free, that we might be able to reflect his presence in his glory. In just a moment, uh, we'll close our, 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 our service with a song, Search Me, O God, and Cleanse Me. It's based out of that Psalm 139. But if you are, are here today and you're not sure, you, you, you've never understood that Jesus, it's not, Jesus didn't come to condemn, he came to free us. He came to uh, meet us at that core of our being and free us into being able to enjoy his presence and to live out a fullness of life. And if that's something that you've never understood or you have questions about, Today, after we close our service in prayer, there'll be people from the prayer ministry up front, and, um, and I'll invite others up. If you have questions, this is a day. This is a day to get some of those questions answered. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father. Thank you that uh, your word is true. Thank you that, that uh, Jesus challenges us at the very core of our being. Because, Father, you desire good for us. And you know that the best in life is that which is surrendered to you and conformed to the image of your Son. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.